Hello. Thank you for coming, first of all. Uh, my name is Nick. This is Andrew from Sysdig and NARP Industries. We're here to give our talk, orchestrate this uh, Kubernetes rootkit. And it wouldn't have been possible without the help of our contractor slash intern in the back, Hervoya. So look at him. Please make him feel self-conscious. <laughs> and uh, we'll get started. I've been going around asking the room, uh, what brought you here, Kubernetes or the rootkit or both? So we'll do a little poll. So if the answer is Kubernetes, hand up quick. About half the room. Now rootkit, less than half the room. And if you know both and like both, raise a hand, please. Hmm. Okay, more than I thought. Cool. Uh, just to get into it, we'll do some background, and then we'll talk about the KubeKit itself. And we'll go into ways to fix things at the very end, and do Q&A at the end. So in 30 seconds, in case you don't know, what a rootkit can do is it hides things, right? There's a good quote from the guy on the bottom of the screen. With a rootkit, you're just putting a bit where it doesn't go or taking away one where it should be, right? So that's the main goal, stealth. And of course, when you do have root access, you want to maintain persistence. So that's a common feature that they all have, that a lot of them do have. And for the higher level ones, the more sophisticated ones, you also use them to maintain command and control. Right? And the uh, sky is the limit on, as to what you can do once you are root. So that's why the bullet point says basically anything else. Right? Your imagination is as far as you can go. It does require privilege, so that's why there is the word root in it. You need to be root to run a rootkit. And you can have a kernel module, which is the most common form. But as you'll see later, you can also have user space components. And the common thread between the two, you know, user land or kernel mode, is that you do have root pillage in both cases. Um, in the chart, we have a little example. Uh, a very common rootkit, diamorphine, which you probably, a lot of you have seen, is a straight up kernel module that hides processes. And an example of a user mode rootkit that, that does the same thing is lib process hider, which you use via LD preload to basically perform the same function. So a little intro to Kubernetes, just in case. A lot of you guys already know, know what it is from the hands. But um, basically, we want to orchestrate containers using some sort of runtime. Uh, so containerd, cryo, in this case, we'll show a bit of Docker fun later on. Um, give it some YAML that describes your services. And it should orchestrate and manage everything for you. Um, something that might come up uh, a bit for those that know Kubernetes. Um, when we talk about namespaces in this talk, we're pr probably going to usually be talking about kernel namespaces, not Kubernetes namespaces, which are ways to uh, organize your pods and services. Um, there's a little uh, diagram here that kind of shows control plane and the data plane with uh, the master nodes organizing things and being the control plane. Um, there's not The point of the diagram is not to show all the services is to show like, hey, there's a lot of things talking back and forth um, and a lot of communication, both between the mas masters in the control plane and the data plane nodes. So our rootkit is named kubekit, very creatively named. And there's a little mascot, a Argonaut, in reference to Kubernetes as well. And our goal with making this was to push that like line of separate separation between the red team and the blue team closer to the blue team side, right? Because at Sysdig, we do operate honeypots for both Kubernetes and Docker. And the attacks that we get are pretty lame, straight up. They're just lame. You know, People run shell scripts, and they might mine some crypto. But there's not a lot of cool stuff happening. And so the goal here was to show that, it, hey, it is possible to write a rootkit that targets these platforms and is actually useful. But at the same time, we're not trying to you know, make it faster for the next hospital to get ransomware. right? So it's not fully fanged. It's more of a proof of concept than anything else. And so given that we do have these portable container runtimes and that let you deploy and run payloads, also known as containers, right? KubeKit is able to hide these malicious containers from the platform. And we have two different modes, as Andrew kind of hinted at, for two different Kubernetes planes, the control plane and the data plane. And we got a little support matrix. You'll notice it's very thin because there are some changes between various Kubernetes versions. So it does work on those ones, but they do require a little bit of tweaking. So out of the box, this is what you get. So let's talk about a little bit about the API. So KubeKit itself is organized around an API. You can see an example here for uh, Docker D, uh, setting a breakpoint. Uh, uh, basically, you can say where you want to 
pause the program that's running uh, and where you want, how you want to edit your memory and then resume execution of the service itself. In this case, that's Docker. Um, if you don't have the offset, so Kubernetes stri ships uh, stripped binaries that don't have symbols, um, you can also set an offset or you can resolve uh, your symbols. Uh, and additionally, we uh, support hiding a lot of fun different things. So files, uh, the kernel module itself, so this would be kubekit.ko, and any sort of processes. We'll see later on with the Kubernetes uh, control plane flavor that we're hiding a user space component, um, as well as supporting removing the rootkit itself during runtime. So say you have some sort of forensics that you're detecting, uh, somebody looking at the platform, you can cleanly remove kubekit itself and have the server still be running. So about the Docker mode, the Docker targeting platform of the, of the kubekit. Uh, why do we do this to target Docker? A, Docker is very common, even to still to this day, you know, like as of last night, there's 1,000 publicly exposed Docker API endpoints that you can just run containers on. So they're probably all honeypots, yeah, but <laughs> you know, some of them might be legit. Docker is very easy for devs to use. They're already familiar with it. Um, I get, I, Pretty confident most of you touched it, if not use it daily. And in that sense, it's because the workflow is familiar, uh, you know, it wouldn't be that hard for a, a red teamer to write up a bad container and stick it in Docker and hide it with kubekit. And so what does the kubekit actually do in terms of Docker? It hides the entire container from the management layer. And that includes not just the existence of the container, but the processes within. And how is that done via the breakpointing on the previous slide? Um, there was a few different ways to do this and things that people already do currently do, but they didn't meet our use case. So just real quick, um, you could use ptrace to kind of debug a process and mess with stuff in real time. But that was kind of slow for us. And you can also use ftrace for hooking kernel functions. But the problem with ftrace was that it will happen, you know, it copies the function into a separate layer of memory and then evaluates it at the same time as, as your hook. And so we wanted to be sure that our container was getting hidden before it returned the function, right? So that we wrote our own breakpointing uh, software. Yeah, and so the, uh, for the K K Kubernetes flavor, um, so we're targeting the control planes. Uh, internally, each one has an API server where the API server will uh, manage wa watching all the containers and will synchronize container lists that are running on pods um, and share those between each other. Um, we want to hide the contain our pods not just on one node from kubectl. We also want to hide it from all API requests that other uh, control nodes don't have an idea of what the container is that's running or our malicious payload. Uh, we also have, of course, a user space app that modifies the JSON responses. So we're hooking into um, the pre-TLS uh, res response sending uh, function within Kubernetes. Uh, and so the effect of this is that we are, uh, the control plane will deploy our payloads and then it will actually lose any sort of recognition after it's already orchestrated and load balanced a malicious, malicious pay, payload or pod. Um, yeah, so a little demo of this working. Let's see if uh, everything works out. Pre-recorded video. Um, so we're going to start with kubectl get pods. Um, you'll note that there's two pods running. Hopefully it's visible. Um, there's another pod, and then there's a debug pod. Um, the debug pod is what we'll be hiding. Um, so everything is hidden behind our, our kubekit environmental variable. And so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start that JSON user space app and insert the kubekit.ko kernel module. Um, and note that you can't really interact with the kubekit unless you have that variable set. So that's just how we choose to hide it. Um, so now, after we've inserted that, we run kubectl get pods again, um, and we see that there's no longer any sort of debug pod visible. And internally, as there are watch points being set within different daemons, it will also be removed from those as well. So run it twice, just to make sure it's stable. And then let's uh, check to see if there's any process, because we started up that user space JSON handler. So checking PS, all we get is the grep response that's not actually um, the process running. When we set the kubekit secret, we can now see our hidden process, um, the JSON handler dot out in the first line. Uh, so this JSON handler, we have it in the local in the local working directory, um, but we also want to make sure that we're hiding it on the disk. So if we try to lsla it, 
it, there is no JSON handler to out when kubeKit is running. Uh, but if we set the secret, it unhides the file. So we also make a virtual device to enable logging or can be used for other things within the API. Uh, it, when we try to check, check for that device, it's hidden until, uh, it's also hidden until we set that key. Or, and finally, we want to check to see, hey, does LS mod see any, uh, the uh, kubekit itself? Uh, by default, it doesn't. Uh, but when we set that key, all of a sudden it's unhidden. Um, note that the libk mod thing is extraneous for now. It goes to standard out. So if you have our standard error, so if you're graphing for anything for any sort of reason, um, that won't be an issue. So now let's go ahead and unload the, the, the rootkit itself. Uh, we do this by removing that slash dev slash kubekit from earlier. Um, and now we can run kubekit get pods again. And now we can see that the debug pod is visible again. And the system is still running and stable. Cool. So as far as detecting and preventing this kind of attack, there's quite a few best practices for sysadmins to take advantage of. Um, this it's not amazing, but there are some security features in Kubernetes that are super useful for this. So the biggest and most important one is to not let things run as privileged, because that just means that there's no boundary between the container and the host, right? Um, so that is the easiest way to get rootkit is to run it as privileged and run a vulnerability at the same time. However, if you're doing the right th things the right way and things aren't running privileged, there's things like uh, SE Linux for Kubernetes, and there's also a access control list that you can set to further you know, sc scale down what a container is actually able to do. And how would you detect something like this? Um, if you're looking for an open source solution, there's things like Falco. Um, Aqua has a tool called Tracy, I believe. It lets you basically write custom rules for system call events and take response actions, right? And so what you would do is look, write a rule that detects the loading of a kernel module, which you can probably pretty safely assume is across the board bad. and take a response based on that rule fires. And so an example like out of the box setup that you could do in one afternoon is install Falco, install Falco sidekick, which is the thing that does the response actions, and then write that rule real quick. It's probably like four or five lines of YAML and test it out. You could have Falco fire the rule event, Falco sidekick sees the rule event and kills the container, kills the pod, kills the host, whatever you want to do. Um, and here's why we think this is important. It kind of goes kind of goes with why we did this. Kubernetes is not going anywhere. They just put it on like the F16 or F35 or something like that. So it's here to stay. Um, and as far as cloud and container tools for both offense and defense, it's still a very fresh industry, even though the products are maturing. Um, the fact that there isn't a rootkit that's publicly known that does this kind of thing, is kind of evidence of that. So that was another reason why we did it. And you know, assuming that you do work for your, your company's blue team, you might just save your CSO's job by <laughs> catching a rootkit like this before it, you know, before they take all your data, before they ransom you, before whatever happens, because we all know that CSO is just there to get fired. <laughs> and if you do have any questions, there's a mic here and a mic there. And mm -hmm. so surveys say that it takes on average 20 seconds before anyone stands up. So I'll give you some time to think of good questions. And if you guys want the code, there's a GitHub link. Um, it should be live. It is live. See a lot of photos. Cool. Play around with it. This is a pretty simple API. All right. Looks like no questions after 20 seconds. So we'll wrap it here. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>